afternoon. I love it. Have you ever seen a meeting begin as ours did today with shouts of joy, hugs, kisses, and even tears? I hope, Dr. Shears Ashby, that's not the usual sign. Um, <laughs> But I must say, I cherish that as our beginning. What a wonderful way to come together and come to this luncheon. I want to welcome you all to the Wisdom Institute's sixth annual event. It's truly wonderful to be back on campus again and to have this time together. Yes, the Wisdom Institute is now six years old. Can you imagine? It means we are old enough to have had some of our founding board members actually retire again, <laughs> but this time from the Wisdom Institute board. COVID had prevented us from publicly acknowledging and thanking members for their service, so we wanted to take a few moments and acknowledge everyone today. I'm going to introduce those who have retired or are retiring from the board, as well as those who have agreed to continue their service with us. So I'm asking all of them to please stand, if you can, as I read your name. <laughs> That's really not in my notes. <laughs> but I had several people say, you might want to add that. <laughs> it is a new time. So founding board members who have retired from the board already are Karen Wench, Larry Wilt, and Willie Lemuse-Smith. Please stand if you can or wave your hands. Now you know why we got off to such a good start. And founding members who are rotating off the board this summer include Terry Aylesworth, Joyce Tenney, and Sandy Parker. And that means that we have room for some new members. And I'd like to introduce them as well. We have new members joining us this summer. Kathy Robb, Sandy Campbell, Cheryl Miller. Please let's thank them. And Ernie Baker will be joining us. Uh, she could not come today as she had a previous commitment in Chicago of all places, but she sends her regrets and her regards. We also want to thank Kathy, welcome and thank Kathy O'Dell for joining the programming committee, one of the busiest committees, ask Leslie Morgan, um, that we have in the Wisdom Institute. And yes, you could actually work on a committee without having to be a board member, consider that. Um, Brian McKay has served in this capacity for several years. Lastly, I'm honored to introduce you to our w Wisdom Institute board members who have been with us over the years and who graciously agreed to continue. And I'll just read names in alphabetical order. They are Linda Baker, and yes, please stand, Dottie Kaplan, Joan Costello, Jonathan Finkelstein, Frank Hansen, way in the back, Betty Glasgow, Art Johnson, sorry, Art Johnson, Patricia Lanou, <laughs> Kathy Miller, <laughs> Pam Morgan, <laughs> Leslie Morgan, <laughs> Sandy Parker, Sorry, it was a good try, um, but he was paying attention. <laughs> He's good at Simon Says too. Art Pittenger. Yeah. 
and our associate director, Kathy Sutphin. Again, we thank all of you, our hardworking, creative, and joyful colleagues. Thank you for all you've done. Lastly, we want to thank Diana Smith and Mike Maurer. They are both still actively employed here at UMBC, and they serve as our liaisons, if you will, with the university and provide essential staff support to the Wisdom Institute. We literally could not do what we do without their expertise, not to mention their delightful sense of humor and generous spirits. I don't think anyone in this room has not received some message from Diana. And believe me, I asked her to sit on my right-hand side. I said, so you could elbow me and make sure everything is in order. So Diana and Mike, who's behind the camera, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Our board members, past and present, along with those who support us, are leaders in redefining retirement, so that words like stop working, disengagement, loneliness, retreat, and withdrawal will no longer be listed as applicable synonyms to the word retirement. Look it up. It's frightening. We are writing a new narrative for retirees and retirement. Indeed, our way of living requires a new list of synonyms reflecting retirement as opportunity. Words such as engaged, connected, lifelong learners, giving back, and choosing how to make a difference characterize our work. Retirement really is an exciting new chapter for each of us. We are grateful to UMBC and appreciate that we may continue authoring our lives in partnership with the campus community. And speaking of those who have supported and helped define our journey, I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Philip Rouse to the podium. As they say, he needs no introduction. Nevertheless, we will say more about Philip later in the program. At this time, Dr. Rouse will introduce our new and esteemed president, Dr. Valerie Shears Ashby. As you listen to President Shears Ashby and questions arise, please write your questions on the cards at your table. Diana will come by and collect them and we'll ask as many uh, of those questions as time allows. Thank you and enjoy lunch. <laughs> I've already been introduced by Diane and as much as I've tried to persuade Diane to introduce me yet again, uh, I'm afraid we're not gonna get that uh, today. Is it not working? I'll pull it up. Is that any better for people? Okay, if I, if I fade away, somebody stand up and tell me and I'll move the microphone closer. Um, so it's my honor today to be able to introduce... Holy... Uh, it's my honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, President of UMBC, Valerie Shears Ashby. Valerie Shears Ashby is the sixth president of UMBC and was officially inaugurated at a ceremony, I think it was less than two weeks ago, if I'm remembering that. By the way, if you weren't able to attend that ceremony, it is online, and I really, it was a beautiful ceremony, and I really highly recommend uh, that you take a look at it, and in particular, um, uh, take the opportunity to listen to our new president um, talking about our UMBC community and the vision for the future of our community. It's really remarkable, and I encourage you to do that, although I suspect many of you have done it already. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about, uh, about uh, President Shears Ashby. Um, I suspect uh, you, like me, um, when... Uh, when Valerie's appointment was announced, uh, we immediately jumped onto Google. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and, and so I think many of you may know some of this already, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about Valerie's amazing background as she comes to UMBC. Um, president Shears Ashby is the first woman to serve as UMBC's president. And she also holds a faculty appointment in UMBC's Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Prior to becoming our president, 
Valerie served as Dean at the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences at Duke University. And during her seven-year tenure there, she led planning and implementation that resulted in very significant increases in faculty recruitment, development activities, fundraising, student engagement at success, et cetera, et cetera. I can't, in the time that I have available today to speak to you, um, go through every accomplishment um, that uh, we want to, that I certainly would want to recognize in Valerie. Throughout her work, she has consistently advanced diversity, equity, and inclusion as a critical pathway to excellence. Valerie is a po polymer chemist by training, and prior to her appointment at Duke, she was chair of the chemistry department at uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. After she joined the UNC faculty in 2003, her leadership positions, and again, it's a very long list, so I'm just going to select some of them for you. Um, serving on UNC's Arts and Sciences Foundation Board of Directors, the Research Advisory Council, the University's Institutional Conflict of Interest Committee, um, um, which I ser I'm sure required a great deal of service on that committee, um, and the Art College of Arts and Sciences Faculty Diversity Task Force. And... Director of Undergraduate Studies. She directed UNC's National Science Foundation Alliance for Graduate Education and the Professoriate, otherwise known as NSF AGAP, which we also have on our own campus uh, right now. And she was also key in developing UNC's collaboration with UMBC to launch the Chancellor's Science Scholars Program, which was among the earliest replication projects for the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. She began her academic career in 1996. Actually, her academic career must have started much earlier than that. But um, uh, in 1996, she became assistant professor at the Iowa State University. At Iowa State, Valerie served as mentor for the Iowa State University Program for Women in Science and Engineering a summer research program for undergraduate and high school students. Valerie is an internationally recognized researcher on synthetic polymer chemistry with an emphasis on designing and synthesizing materials for biomedical applications. She is the recipient of, again, this is another list, I cannot go all the way through it, um, she was a recipient of the NSF Career Development Award, du DuPont Young Faculty Award, the 3M Young Faculty Award, as well as numerous teaching and service awards, including the UNC Chapel Hill General Alumni Association Faculty Service Award, and the Bowman and G Gordon Gray Distinguished Term Professorship for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching and Research. In 19, oh, sorry, in 2022, Woman of Color magazine named Valerie as its technologist of the year. I hope Valerie won't mind if I add a few personal remarks. Um, as you probably realize as provost, um, appropriately, I was not involved in any way in the search for, uh, for, for our new president. Um, but I want to share with you a remarkable experience. And that was uh, uh, after Valerie was appointed. I got to sit down and meet with her. I think it was 20, 30 minutes. And, um, and a remarkable thing happened. Within about five minutes, I realized that Valerie's values were perfectly aligned with what we feel as a community are our shared values. And that was the most remarkable experience for me and an incredibly optimistic one for our community and everything that each and every one of you have actually done, and I'll talk about this a little bit later maybe, um, to found this university, to develop it over the last almost 60 years to the place it is today, and perhaps even more importantly than that, lay the foundation for greatness in the future of our institution. So with that, um, please welcome 
President Valerie Shears Ashby. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Not yet. Can you hear me in the back yet? <clears throat> Sorry. Can you hear me in the back? Is it better? Okay. Uh, I will use my I'm teaching organic chemistry voice. Uh, and you all are the people who sit in the back of the room so that I won't call upon you. Uh, but what you don't know is that I will come to you, right? Uh, so I always go to the back of the room first. So thank you so much. Um, let me say thank you to Philip. Uh, for that lovely introduction that was far too long, Philip, but thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your kindness. And, and before I go on, let me just say, um, this is what I always say about Philip Rouse. I keep saying to people, he is the most decent human being I think I've ever met. I mean, I, I, I've met some wonderful people in my lifetime. And this person is extraordinary. Um, as a faculty member, as a colleague, as a leader, um, but the human being that he is, if you don't know him yet, well, oh my goodness. Um, I, I say everywhere, if I can be half the person that Philip is, uh, I would be uh, thrilled. So I just will tell you that he has been nothing but welcoming and kind and generous to me since I stepped on, in, on this campus. So I am very grateful to you, Philip. Thank you so very much. And he is UMBC's, I'm telling you what you already know, he is UMBC's longest serving provost. Um, and so I, I truly appreciate what you've done for this campus. And I also just want to echo for a few moments Philip's gratitude uh, for everybody in this room. Uh, wow, you have given me the ultimate gift. I recognize that this university has been built over 56 years and several people when you were getting off the elevator said that you had been here for 40 of those 56 years. Uh, has anyone been here longer than, worked at UMBC longer than 40 years? Wow. Okay, so you are UMBC. <laughs> and so uh, in much of the way that I say thank you to Freeman for the gift of UMBC, I, I really say thank you to you because you are the university. And so I really appreciate the gift that each of you uh, has left to me uh, and to all of us who are here now. And so I'm just going to take a few moments. Um, I should also thank the folks who... Diane. I met Diane early on. And let me tell you, she's not just a leader, she's an advocate. So Diane said to me, these are important people and you need to spend time with us, basically. <laughs> she, she, you need to know how important we are. I'm, like, I'm pretty clear, Diane. <laughs> she is a force. Uh, and so I appreciate her leadership and I appreciate all of you who are serving and participating. Um, it would be a shame to have all of this wisdom walk away from the institution and never be connected back to the institution. That would be a shame. So I am grateful that this is ex in existence uh, and that it is so active. Uh, so I'm just gonna say a few words because I'd rather hear the questions uh, that you all have uh, created and want to pose to me. I'm happy to talk about anything that you would like. People always ask me, is there something that's off the table? The answer is no. Um, because the rest of the world doesn't know anything is off the table. So um, I get asked everything that you can imagine. Uh, let me just say a few words about what it's been like to start here at UMBC. Pure joy. Ah, uh, not, without, not without, you know, all of the, you know, you worked here. Right? Uh, this, is an, this is a university, just like every other university. But pure joy. And what gives me joy is that we have the right values and we have the right, this beautiful culture that has been established intentionally over decades. That thrills me. So I'll say a little bit about what's been happening here. So I started actually on August the 1st, so about nine months in, I think, here. And um, over the last, I'll say some more about what's happened in the last several weeks. So we have gone through this process. You may have been familiar with the bold conversations. I don't know if you've read about that. We launched this series of conversations this semester, 22 conversations that we had, 22 hour-long conversations with more than 1,000 participants across campus, faculty, staff, students, alums, community members, anybody, as I say, who thinks that UMBC belongs to them. 
participated. And by the way, I'll just give you a little bit of an aside. Everybody thinks that UMBC belongs to them, <laughs> which is a beautiful thing. You've done something in this community and in this part of the state that everybody thinks that UMBC belongs to them. I know that because wherever I am, people stop me to tell me how I should run the university. <laughs> and I say, oh, are you an alum? They say, no. I say, are you a parent? No. Do you live in Arbutus? No. I can be in Columbia, I was literally in Columbia, coming out of the UPS store and a woman stopped to tell me what she thought about UMBC and what I should be doing. <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, this, is, this is the world's university. Um, but there's something about the community that you've created here that people care about what we're doing and they value our students um, and they value the research and all the work that we do in community engagement. Um, so we've had those 22 listening sessions across multiple topics, every topic that you can imagine, and everyone was welcome to attend. And I had the opportunity to really hear from the community what has mattered. Essentially, people had the opportunity to say to me, please don't break this. Like, everybody needs to say that. There's some things people said, please break, right? And then there are those, the first thing that they said is, this is fantastic, please don't break it. Uh, which I needed to hear. Um, and then they, they offered to me you know, things that they thought could be better and the challenges that we face in order to really continue on this really amazing climb that we've been on for the last 56 years. Um, so those conversations happened and then we rolled right into inauguration. And I'm just gonna say a few things about what happened during that week. Uh, it was extraordinary. It was UMBC on full display. Uh, so it started, people said, are you tired from the last three days. I said, no, this has been going on for 10 days. <laughs> we started the weekend, but we actually started the week prior at Shady Grove. So we started the Tuesday prior at Shady Grove. They had a reception there and I've had an opportunity to spend time with those students who are extraordinary. The faculty and staff there are really amazing and we're doing something that's exemplary in the state there. And then it followed on that Friday with Quad Mania. And if you've never been to Quad Mania, you need a nap before Quad Mania. We were there until 10.30, which is beyond my bedtime. And we had 15 different student acts that were amazing. And the students had created, while they were out on the lawn, they had created these soft chairs for me, where I, I had a chance to not sit on the grass, but students were had the opportunity to come and sit with me in this gated off area and have a conversation during the entirety of Quad Mania. So I had about 10 different groups of students come in and out and just sit in this space with me and have conversation. It was amazing. And then it continued with, uh, we celebrated our faculty and staff at a reception, which I love the, we were talking about this, how much faculty and staff are engaged together here at UMBC. And that was an opportunity actually for members of the search committee to re-interview me. That was interesting. Uh, I, it was great, it was great, I enjoyed that. But it was an opportunity because it was a closed process as Philip said previously. It gave members of the community an opportunity to see the conversation and also to have some of their questions asked directly to me, which was so much fun. I, I was happy, I think I passed. <laughs> um, and then we had a faculty salon. And this was a series of almost TED Talks. And we had one faculty member represent each one of the overall arching disciplines. So we had an artist and a humanist and a social scientist and a natural and mathematical scientist and an engineer. And the overall theme was community engaged research. So we had you know, a physicist talking about community engaged research because that's what we do. Um, and it was wonderful to hear all of our faculty talk about their research. It was so inspiring. I'm trying to go down the list. Um, oh, and then I had a reception for graduate students that was held in the, in the UC ballroom. It was amazing. We gave them a lunch that was so incredible. And it was what, first of all, graduate students love free food, right? Uh, I, I have still have that gene from my PhD days. But what, we, what I wanted them to know is that graduate students at, U, at UMBC are just as important to us as undergraduate students. And so we had this amazing lunch. And because our graduate students, like our undergrads, come from all over the world, 
it was a pretty significant feat that Chartwells pulled off for all of those students to feel like there was food there that was representative of who they were and were welcomed. It was an extraordinary opportunity to thank and recognize our graduate students. Um, so that was the week that led us into uh, the inauguration. Philip, it was just last Thursday. <laughs> I know a lot has happened since then, uh, but I'm, I will stop there and I'll just say it's been a wonderful welcome to this campus. Um, I am delighted to be here. And when my family, if you watched any of the inauguration or you were here, 25, 26 of my family members were here, uh, my whole family. We travel in a pack. Um, so... <laughs> My brother was here, who is nine years older than I am, My sis and his family, which means his wife and their five children and their children. And my uh, sister was here with her wife and her wife, my wife, my sister-in-law's family, her parent, my sister-in-law's parents were here. And then my uh, youngest brother was here. And, uh, and then my aunt, who is 91 years old, was here. Um, she actually is living with me for a minute. Uh, so she, she just started living with me about two weeks ago. It, it is fabulous. Um, and so we had the entire Shears uh, family here. What was so special to me is that they knew that I was drawn to a place that had similar values. But when they came on this campus, they said, oh, this is perfect. They loved you all. And they felt so good that I was here. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for everything that you've done to create this amazing institution. And uh, our students are just extraordinary, just extraordinary. It's why we wake up and do what we do every day. Um, and so thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions or hear any comments or thoughts or any recommendations you have on leadership. <laughs> I'm sure you may have some. I, I am happy to take those, those recommendations. So. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your welcome. Thank you. Can you, yeah. So um, the first question, can you hear me in the back? They're saying no. Higher? Whoa, OK. So the first question is, UMBC, UMBC has a um, noble history of having a diverse community of students, <clears throat> faculty, and staff members. How will you continue enhancing UMBC's diversity by efforts to recruit? Really? Hello? All right, I, I kind of weird. It's very close, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, one more time. It goes, UMBC has a noble history of having a diverse community of students, faculty, and staff members. How will you, con is that working? Oh, geez, okay. How will you continue enhancing UMB UMBC's diversity by efforts to recruit Jewish students, faculty, and staff members oh, in the coming interesting. years? Interesting, okay, um, it's, it's hard for me to sit down. Um, so I'm going to stand I, up. A bit. No, you don't have to, but I, I prefer it. Thank you. OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I appreciate the question. So um, let me just say that I, part of what drew me here was our commitment to diversity, because I'm committed to excellence. And I don't believe that you can be excellent if you're not diverse. This is a premise on which we have built you know, the reputation of UMBC. Um, interestingly enough, um, I come from a previous institution that had a very strong Jewish community. Um, and so for me, it is about making sure, and it's not just about Jewish community of Jewish students or faculty or staff, by the way, we have a lot of support for Jewish students on our campus. Um, but it is about making sure that if, as we diversify our students, faculty, and staff, that we are ready for them when they get here. That has been our 
a little bit of place if you ask me where we could work a, work to change things a little bit. We have sometimes gotten in front of ourselves where we bring people to campus and we weren't fully ready to support who they were in total. And whether that's religious diversity or economic diversity or even in the food that we serve, right? We have to be ready for whoever we recruit. Um, and so it tells people that they're welcomed when they arrive, to your, arrive here and you've already thought about it. And so I don't see that as a different kind of group of people. We certainly have a, a very, very strong um, support for Jewish students, um, but that certainly can be enhanced um, for our faculty and staff also. Um, how will you be supporting the humanities at UNBC? Uh, every day, all day, and twice on Sunday. <laughs> Uh, that is just an easy one for me. Uh, I am at my core, uh, I think I'm more at my core a humanist and maybe even a little bit of a social scientist um, just in my everyday being. I, I love chemistry. Um, and to the degree that chemistry as far as relationships is a part of what I do, I, I don't do any organic chemistry on a day-to-day -day basis unless a, a student comes to my office hours and I get the chance to teach them how to do a mechanism, which is fantastic. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, leadership is humanities and social sciences, period. Um, and the disciplines are so critical for everything that our students are going to need. The world is in a mess, not because the science wasn't there. It's because we didn't think about the humanistic part of everything. You know, we didn't think about, well, what was the history? Or how, do the, how does this group of people communicate? Or tell me about the psychology if you're talking about the social sciences or the economics of that thing. So there's the application of everything we do to hum, with and to humankind, that is the humanity. Besides that, you can't have, in my opinion, a joyful life hmm. without the arts and the humanities. I don't know what living is without the arts and humanities. And so um, I was blessed to be the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Duke. And we had, in that college, actually the humanities and the arts were the strength of the college. Um, and so I've learned a lot about what my faculty and staff in those disciplines need. Um, and it's important. It's really critical because also UMBC has a reputation as a STEM school. Right, and so my scientists love that I'm a chemist. My humanists are afraid, <laughs> right? Until they hear me say, no, no, I see you and you are a critical part of what we do. So this is really important for me, um, that our reputation is strong in the science, as it has to be, but strong in all those other disciplines and visible and valued in those other disciplines. So this is a related question, it says, how can you support small humanities departments? Uh -huh. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know who you are, right? I know exactly who you are. Where's my former chair of ancient studies? I know you. <laughs> I know you. I know you. Do you know who Tolly Bo Boatwright is? Okay. She sat in my office many, so she was a former chair of classics at Duke. I get it. The beauty, let's just say, I love that I was a dean of arts, humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. As a matter of fact, what I did as a dean, and I'll, you know, I have to remember to take off my dean hat and not try to do the dean's job, um, and not try to do the provost job, right? Um, but a part of what I did at Duke when I was a dean was I re recognized pretty quickly that my smaller departments had a completely different set of concerns than my larger departments and particularly my small departments in the humanities. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would have what I call, and we would laugh because we decide where to put the adjective. Sometimes we'd say we'd, we're having a meeting of small department chairs, and that, that was a weird, <laughs> that was kind of strange. Um, and then we say, we, we're gonna have a meeting of department chairs who run small departments, that's better, right? Uh, and so, but we would work through a set of concerns that just, you know, when you're small, for example, who's doing service? The same people over and over mm. and over again. Mm. Or when you're small and you know some mandate or something comes from the institution that you have to carry out, how are you gonna execute that? Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I, so that's all I can say is I know. Um, and, and our provost knows, right? And our, and our deans know. So um, we will really be mindful um, of how to support 
our faculty across the disciplines. I also know that my humanists need time more than anything else. Um, you know, my chemists, that's a different thing, right? I've got 10 people in a lab working for me. I still need time, but time for a humanist, particularly in my book disciplines, is a completely different thing. So I, I appreciate the question, mm -hmm. um, and yes, I see you. <laughs> I see you. Yeah. So the next question is, did anything from the bold conversations surprise you? Yes and no. Hmm. Not in content. I had been here August, September, October, November, December, and it wasn't the first time I was listening to the community. So I had heard from faculty and staff and students, and not everybody, but I'd heard quite a bit. And you know, one of the things I love about UMBC is that we're consistent. So you don't hear 15 different messages, no matter the, um, the audience or the person who's speaking. So faculty, staff, and students, they're just a consistent set of about six or seven messages over and over again. Mm. So it wasn't surprising. What was surprising to me is how many people participated yeah. and how invested. I, I knew you all loved this place, but when 1,400 people register, right, and more than 1,000 people participate in 22 hours. Now, I was in every single one, right? I was an, and that was my commitment because I wanted to hear people's voices directly. I didn't want somebody to tell me what was said. I wanted to hear it myself. But there were multiple faculty and staff who attended five, six, seven different listening sessions. It was amazing to me how committed people were. I, I, deep, even more deeply, I understood how, how, pe how people were committed and willing. Uh, the other thing that is surprising is, as wonderful as the place is, there were several things that people said, we can do that better. I love that. Can you give an example? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll go where you started, um, semi in a place to where you started. People said to me, we've done a great job with student diversity, but look at our faculty. <laughs> I don't think I don't need to say anymore. I mean, and, and as, a, as UMBC, why wouldn't we try to lead? Right? We put a stake in the ground in inclusive excellence. It can't just be for the students. It has to be across the board. Right. Um, so it was it was interesting. I mean, there are several places uh, people said to me, you know, we have this amazing array of students who come to us, which we do. We have first time first year students, we have transfer students, we have part time students, we have commuter students. We have, I mean, we've got this amazing diversity of students. And what they said to me is there's, there are some students that are not having the fullness of a UMBC experience. Okay. That's true. I'd already heard it. By the way, I have office hours for students on Thursdays from three to five, and they're always full, and they tell me the truth. Undergrad and graduate students. So a transfer student, I love this, this is total UMBC. She came in last semester. She said, I can hardly find my way. Now, that was an individual. I get it. That was an individual. But I've heard it multiple times. She came back this time saying, I am so good. I have found my way. And here are the 10 things that I think you ought to do differently. <laughs> That's UMBC, right? That's a UMBC student. Um, she wanted it to be better for the people who come behind her. So there are things that we can, this welcoming and inspiring inquisitive minds from all backgrounds, just sit with that for a second. I love that we say it. It's a bold statement, but then you have to act on it. That means that every single student out there has to be having an extraordinary experience. They have to feel like they're, and that's not fully the case. So there is, there is work for us to do. So there are like three related questions. One is, what are the challenges facing the international community at UMBC? Oh, wow. And what are the prospects for uh, increasing the globalization or internationalization of the curriculum at UMBC. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll go, I'll start at the end, maybe, and just say a word. This is my statement about the curriculum, which it, Philip has said this over and over again, and I need the faculty to know. I don't own the curriculum. Right? I, I, there's, some, there's some things for, for me that are religious when it comes to leadership of an academic institution. The faculty own the curriculum. That's the first thing. The faculty own the right to choose their own graduate students. And the faculty own the right to choose their faculty. 
never should an administrator cross that line, in my opinion. Okay. So when you ask me about the curriculum, I'll have an opinion about the curriculum, but that you don't want me leading the curriculum. You want the chief academic officer working with the faculty to think about the curriculum. We will have an opportunity in the next year or so to really reimagine our curriculum. Um, and that was one of the comments that I heard when we were talking about in the listening sessions um, that were from faculty and staff, because we also have staff who are teaching, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we heard that we want to think about a more global um, curriculum or experience. And some of that is also about the number of students who are studying abroad and or can or cannot for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Some of those are financial reasons. Um, but having some version of global experience, we heard that. And I, I think it's important for who we are. Um, I'd also love to see us increase our global connections in research. Um, with other universities across the country. And faculty are doing this, you know, they, they do it gener generically. Um, but I would like for us to really think about how we would do that more intentionally. Um, and then the first part of your question, remind me. No, just what, what, are the, um, what are the challenges confronting international students or the international oh. community at UMBC? Yeah, so I just, I literally, um, today is Friday, <laughs> but I had to remember what today is. Today is Friday, but I had a student group in my office, because usually I have students in on Thursday afternoon, but I had a student group in my office, most all international students. There are several challenges. Again, this is one of those, were we ready? Hmm. We weren't ready. Now I'm talking to you all like we're family, right? These aren't things that I say to the Baltimore Sun, right? <laughs> okay. When, they, when the Baltimore Sun asked me that question, I say, oh, we have done an incredible job, which is true. And we always have room for improvement. That's the way I say that, okay? But when I'm talking to you, I'm telling you, we admitted a large number of, of particularly graduate students who are international. We weren't ready. We weren't ready. Now, we did everything we could in the interim to get ready, but we weren't ready. And the students felt it, and they still feel some of it. Um, there are challenges, for example, if you're talking about the graduate students, they can't work. Right? Some of, most of them can't work off of camp, off campus. So if there are not enough jobs on campus, then they're financially challenged. Um, there are all sorts of things that come with being an international student on our campus. We've done a really, I always start with, we've done a really great job in many ways, but the numbers increased so quickly here in the last, I don't know how long, Philip, couple of years, that we just we weren't we weren't in front of it. Um, we have an opportunity now to get in front of it, and we also have an opportunity to think about what is the constitution of our student body. So some of what has happened is you know we've increased our numbers, but we did not decide how we were going to increase the numbers. You know, um, do we want more students in the arts, humanities, and social sciences? You know, do we want more graduate students that are U.S. citizens? Do we want, you, we have to be thoughtful. And it just kind of happened to us. The growth happened to us. Um, so there's a lot of work to do on the back end to think about what is the Constitution and then to be prepared for those students because we can't say we're welcoming <laughs> inquisitive minds from all backgrounds and they can't find food on campus that they can eat or they don't have a place to practice whatever their religious practice is. Can't have it both ways. Yeah. So the next question I kind of like uh, for the <laughs> non-science faculty and staff in the yeah. in the in the um, room. Can you explain polymer chemistry? Oh, <laughs> all day, all day, all day, all day, all day, all day. I told day. you you'd like it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So here's what I tell people. Um, so. I'll start at the end and I'll go back to the beginning. So how many of you are sitting on a cushioned chair? Raise your hands. Okay. Not only, how many of you think that that, that material you're sitting on is leather? You, you, you all think it is not, right? Okay. Okay. So the material that you are sitting on is a polymeric material. The cushion underneath is a polymeric material. Okay, this is personal, but if you're willing to share, has anybody had a knee replacement or a hip replacement? <laughs> okay, if you have, there's some polymeric material in there. Anybody wearing glasses? That's not glass, right? That's not glass. That's not glass. That's a polymeric material. Anybody have on anything that's rayon 
polyester, get it? Polyester. <laughs> that was the hint. That was the hint, right? If you have on any of that, that's a polymeric material. The tires on your car, polymeric material. The material in your cell phone, polymeric material. I mean, you pretty much can't live without polymers. Here's the downside. None of them biodegrade yeah. at the rate that you want them to. Those materials are going to be around for decades. So I have a little something in my heart every time I do an experiment and I create something. Because I, literally, even the experiments that don't work, I've created something that's not going away. Okay. So it's a fascinating thing. So those are all polymeric materials. Um, I will tell you the difference between, now I'm going to go down in a little bit of theory just for a second. But you all are so smart, you can go right with me. The difference between a polymer and a monomer. You feel it? Mm -hmm. Mono, polo, poly. Okay. So mo uh, there, look at that. The Oh, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. So the polymer, just imagine a polymer is huge, right? Polymer, right? If you think about a picture of, of molecules, it's long chains. Are you all with me? <laughs> okay, if you have a pile of long chains and you just kind of mix them up together, they get tangled, like shoestrings would get tangled. You with me? That tangle, that, that entanglement gives them strength. That's why they are materials. Can you imagine that? Okay, so now a monomer is just something that's just one, like a quarter. Just pick a quarter, right? Just, okay, a pile of quarters is never going to get entangled. Can you follow that? Mm -hmm. So therefore, they have no strength. So for example, Tylenol is like a quarter. When you hit it with a hammer, what does it do? You pulverize it. If you hit nylon with a hammer, what happens? Exactly. Isn't that fun? <laughs> okay. So the way you make polymers is to con you do these chemical reactions that connect a bunch of monomers into these long chains. And that's what I did. Ah. <sighs> All right. You all are great. That was fantastic. Oh my goodness. Oh, that was just that just warmed my heart. Thank you. Um, so who was leading the planning for Spring Grove and ah. <laughs> are there goals that um, have been identified? Uh, nobody and and no. <laughs> uh, that's that's the honest answer. Um so here's the the deal. Um that is an amazing opportunity for us. There are many institutions in the world that are landlocked, so they can't grow. For example, College Park. And I'm not, I'm not just picking at them, although I, I in, it is a pastime now with Daryl and me. Um, but College Park is 40,000, and it is not going to grow. It, it, tweak, maybe, but not grow. So with 50% of Marylanders not receiving a college degree, who's going to grow? That's us. And I'm not just making that up. That's what the chancellor has asked of me. Am I willing to be the other big research institution? The answer is yes. Right? We want, our whole job, our whole reason for being here is to educate Marylanders right, first. We couldn't do that if we were landlocked. So we're not even landlocked on our campus, but we have this incredible gift that is an albatross, <laughs> financially. Things I don't say to the Baltimore Sun, okay? <laughs> you, you're my inside crowd, I'm letting you underneath the hood. It's fantastic to have that much space. It would cost us hundreds of millions of dollars to renovate everything over there or get it in good condition. It will be a very long process. Um, but I'm excited about even the beginnings of the conversation. The other piece, the reason why I have to say no, because it hasn't started yet, is because I can't have my neighbors in Arbutus and Catonsville getting nervous that we're over here planning something that they don't know about. So this will be a real collaborative experience with our neighbors because that, that matters to them. The other thing that I care deeply about is the history of mental health over there. Right? We, we, are, we have that history here, right? Um, thank you. I, I've read your book now twice. Um, and so um, we have 400 adult residents still at Spring Grove. If you have visited there, it is so sad. The facility is in 
not great condition. The state has not invested in adult mental health. And I wouldn't, ah, it's painful. So all of that is to be considered as we go forward, and it will take us years. There are some things that we may be able to do on a short-term basis. We have a collaboration with UMB where they have their uh, psychiatric research facility that is one of the best in the world. Um, I don't know if you knew that. Um, so we may try to do something sooner rather than later in the teaching research space around that facility but it will be a very long process financially and also caring for those 400 people and then working with our community to make sure that whatever we do, everybody feels good about it. So this is kind of a related question, but if Sh Shady Grove is off into the future, uh, Spring Grove, excuse me, um, and the Chancellor wants us to grow, mm -hmm. uh, have you discussed target numbers? No, um, not yet. Okay. Um, literally, we just had this conversation. I mean, you all are you know more than some of my team members know at this point. I just had my annual review, which is odd, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> but it was time, so I did my annual review. And this is where we had this conversation. It was just a month ago. Um, we will do some very serious projections. And this is also going back to not just how big is the class, but what is the class? How many undergraduates in which disciplines? How many graduate students in which disciplines? How many masters versus PhD students? Which programs do we see Marylanders wanting and needing? Um, what is the workforce going to be in certain? You know that that's the conversation. It'll be a lot. So we're going to undergo a strategic plan process starting in the fall. The first part of that was these twenty-two listening sessions. Right, we had to listen to our community first, and so we will walk that out in the fall. It won't take us long. Um, okay. Because we've got to get moving, but I don't know those answers yet. Okay. Oh, that I'm was. not sure that. Uh, so one of the questions was uh, was asking the question about shared governance and your perception of it, and yes. I'd like to add: Do you see limits on shared governance in places where perhaps shared governance is not appropriate? Oh no. Okay. No, um, no shared <laughs> on a on a university campus. Shared governance is critical and appropriate. What, one of the listening sessions was on shared governance. What I discovered is that when people say the words, different people mean different things mm -hmm. on our campus, which is always the case on a university campus. And so a part of our discussion going forward is going to be, what do we mean by shared governance? Uh, first of all, I'm a fan. I've come from universities where it's been strong in the faculty and the staff and the students. Um, it's to the benefit of everybody to have healthy, strong, shared governance. All of us just have to understand what we're talking about. Um, so what I always say is, I'm not going to do your job. Please don't try to do mine. But if we work together, you're, I can make your job easier and you can make mine easier and we can serve the students even better. That's the perfect version of shared governance okay. right, for me. Um, and so we will talk about how to do that. Um, yeah, it's really important to me. And I... The other way that I'll just say about shared governance, it's important to me to show up physically, to show up for shared governance. And I've had people already comment to me that they were surprised that I showed up to a meeting and stayed. So, you know, the meetings aren't short, are they, Philip? <laughs> I mean, they're not, <laughs> the meeting is not short. The shortest meeting we will have is an hour and a half, right? And they're surprised that I'm gonna sit there for night, absolutely, right? And for every single, um, University Steering Committee meeting, I'm gonna be in that room. I'm not gonna send a representative, I'm gonna be in that room, unless I'm traveling or something. So the engagement is real for me. <laughs> um, so I want it to be healthy and vibrant, and I want us to all be clear so that each of us can do our best work for our students. Yeah. So that's basically the questions I received. Uh, has anybody got questions prompted by the, our conversation? And just, if you do, just stand up and ask. You can ask me anything. Willie. Can you hear it in the back? Okay, so he started by saying this is an old question, 1975. And he hopes she, the president can solve the problem. <laughs> Thank you. 
this new guy in my stomach. Stomach, what was it? Oh, 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 oh. So the just the sec, Will. So the question was, would you be willing to uh, support the construction of a faculty staff club? I so appreciate that. Uh, so several several things I can say to that. Um, so first of all, let me go where you started or where you, in the beginning of your comment. One of the things that has been in the space of what can we do better? Mm. I've been here for eight months and I'm introducing faculty to each other. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And I get it. I get it. People are doing their jobs, right? They're not, they're not looking up and out. As much as we say we are collaborative, we are collegial, all that's true, we are a community, there is not as much engagement as you would expect on this campus across, the students are more engaged across disciplines than the faculty. When I go to a, you know, I stop at a, in the commons and I say, tell me about who's at this table. All different disciplines from all over the world, they have figured out how to do that. Faculty, not as much. And I also heard in the research symposium, or the research um, listening session, that folks wanted to be more interdisciplinary. That was shocking to me. That was shocking. Mm -hmm. There you go. That was <laughs> shocking to me. I didn't re expect that because I thought, this is a place that's welcoming. You. Surely you all are talking across the discipline. No, not as much as you would anticipate. Um, so I do appreciate that that is an, a real thing. Uh, the question for me will be, how, and it's not actually my whole question, um, but how do we facilitate that in a way that is easy for faculty and staff to engage? Now I'm talking about the present faculty and staff just for one moment to engage. Um, I can, we will have to think about what, they're gonna have to say what that means. Um, there's nothing like building something for people and then they say, I didn't, I didn't ask you for that, <laughs> right? Or you know, students will, you know, you have a program that you think the students want and they don't show up. Right, so I'm I'm very careful about telling people how I'm going to help them. My question is, 
how would you like as the faculty and staff to be supported for that engagement to be more significant? So I think that that's possible, and I don't think that that's a building. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that's a building. There may be spaces that we need where people will gather and just kind of do that serendipity mm -hmm. that happens, um, but I'm not sure that that's a building for my present faculty and staff. As far as um, facilities, new facilities on campus, uh, if Greg were in the room, I will tell you that if you will write the check, I will build it. <laughs> and there are a lot of priorities that are critical to faculty, students, to our vision and mission um, that do have to do with facilities. And we are going to have to raise some funds, and thank goodness the state does support us um, in building. Um, but that one probably for folks who are not on campus is probably not the highest priority unless somebody tells me they're gonna, if it's gonna be the Diane Lee facility, you got it. <laughs> You've got it. I will, I, the engineering is not the issue. Uh, rarely is the engineering the issue, the, the funds are the issue. What I will say to you is that, you know, anytime you all wanna be on this campus, we will do our best to, to accommodate whatever you need uh, because you're welcomed. I will also tell you, I've got faculty and staff and Philip knows this, and students at this point who are saying we're just out of space, we're out of the kinds of spaces that we need, and that's our highest priority at the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, Madam President, thank you so much. I think oh. you gave us a wonderful opportunity to thank meet you, you, to thank get you. your ideas. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much, I appreciate it. Wow, never, never did I think I would want to take organic chemistry at this stage of my life. Wow. <laughs> I, it, it's hard, hard to speak. It's time for dessert, although I feel we've already had the best that we're going to have in this luncheon. I really, really do. Somebody said dessert is boring. Dr. Shears Ashby, you are not. What a life force and what a wonderful, wonderful time for us. Um, I feel listening is always very important. Problem posing perhaps more important than problem solving. And let me tell you, you passed. <laughs> you passed. You never have to question that again. Um, Dr. Shears Ashby, President Ash Shears Ashby, President Valerie, just Valerie. <laughs> It doesn't feel like a just Valerie, let me tell you. But we are truly pleased and excited to be sharing this phase of UMBC's journey with you. I can't wait to call Dr. Perman and tell him you made the best choice. In fact, people used to say, what does UMBC really stand for? And we would say, you made the best choice. <laughs> we love it too. And please know that we assembled here are proud to be part of the UMBC family and to remain part of the UMBC family. You thought you had a large family gathering before. <laughs> it's only growing in leaps and bounds and moments and seconds. We want you to know that we are not just here to cheer you on, although cheer we will, but we are also here to help as we can whenever you need us. So please don't ever hesitate to call on anyone here and call on the Wisdom Institute collectively. We are part of your family and we are so proud and so happy to be able to claim you as our leader. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish I could handle a microphone and stand over there and talk, but I'm one of those who goes white knuckled on the podium, right? Um, you probably heard my knees shake before you heard my voice quiver. But I have another honor today, and that is to reintroduce Dr. Philip Rouse. I said that we would do so and talk about him a little bit later, so now is that time. Provost Rouse has attended every single signature event since our first gathering in 2018. 
He has always extended a warm and sincere welcome to everyone in attendance, and he has always graciously introduced our keynote speakers, as he did today with our new and already beloved President Valerie. In looking back, however, we realize that we have never ever formally introduced Philip as we know him best. A real introduction seemed overdue and appropriate, maybe a little bit unnecessary, but we decided to go ahead anyway. Everyone knows that Philip has been our provost, and yes, we agree, you're not gonna find a more decent human being. We know that he speaks with a delightful British accent Dr. Rabowski once described as enviable, <laughs> and that he hails from the physics department. Nevertheless, we decided to share a bit of his personal and professional history with the expectation that what you hear will be affirmation of something you already knew, and perhaps maybe something new. If you look at his bio, this is the kind of thing you will see. And I'm going to be reading a lot of this because as he did with, with Valerie, I don't know this part by heart. Philip was granted a PhD in theoretical physics from the Imperial College of Science and Technology in the United Kingdom in 1986. He conducted postdoctoral research at Imperial College, the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Cambridge. His research is in the field of theoretical condensed matter physics, and he has contributed to the fundamental understanding of the crystallography of surfaces, the dynamics and structure of negative ion states at surfaces, and nanophysics. Philip has a strong interdisciplinary background, and the results of his research have been published extensively in materials science, physics, and chemistry journals. Philip joined the UMBC community in 1990 and holds the rank of professor in the Department of Physics. Prior to his appointment as provost, he served as Dean of the College of Mat Natural and Mathematical Sciences. As Dean, Philip provided leadership in creating the college's active science teaching and learning environment, or CASEL, as it is, is known. This was one of our first pedagogical models for actively engaged student learning. The legacy of his work with CASEL can be seen in the tour today when we go to the Interdisciplinary Life Sciences Building. Philip participated in shared governance on campus as faculty senate vice president and then as faculty senate president. On July 1, 2012, he was appointed provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. As provost, he has played a leadership role in supporting research into innovative models supporting student success. These include projects with NIH, HHMI, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the NSF um, STEM Student Project, we fondly called iCubed, and now the STEM Build Project at UMBC, and there's more, and there's more. These are just a few of the highlights from Philip's resume. In fact, this quick glance affirms that he is an accomplished scholar, teacher, and administrator. But there's more that we can glean from this synopsis of his academic journey. For example, we know that Philip not only talks about topics like shared governance, student success, and inclusive excellence, but he participates actively in each, living his values as a faculty member, a researcher, and as an administrator. Similarly, he has demonstrated fidelity to interdisciplinarity in all of his professional roles. He has focused on minute details such as the failure of nanoscale metallic interconnects and integrated circuits while simultaneously attending to the delivery of the academic program at UMBC. Think about that, the academic program at UMBC. It entails teaching and learning, research, academic support services, and enrollment management, including admissions and financial aid. In addition, Philip has overseen the campus planning progress, working collaboratively with vice presidents and deans and faculty and students and staff to coordinate strategic planning and budgeting. Yes, Philip's resume speaks to his responsibilities and to his many achievements. What is not said, however, is anything specific about his spirit, his wit, imagination, 
and faith in the power of education to create a better world. A message to alumni, and I think our own lived experiences, can fill in the rest of this story. Speaking to alumni, Philip said the following, and I quote, you will join the tradition of UMBC alumni who, through their life's work, continue to advance our understanding of our own humanity, our democracy, the natural work, world that surrounds us, and most importantly, you will make a difference in the lives of others. In this sentence, Philip casts himself as we know him best, as a leader with a deep ethic of care for all of humanity, a commitment to the common good, and a willingness to work to sustain the natural world. Importantly, he ties his hopes for graduates of UMBC with his own way of being in the world. Philip believes not only in our power to make the world a better place, but his life work has been oriented to making a difference, and he has. He leads with integrity and soul. He shows the same caring and generous spirit with us as retirees and members of the Wisdom Institute that he does with faculty, student, and graduates. Philip has given unwavering support to the creation and development of the Wisdom Institute from the time that it was just an idea. He has repeatedly stated that the Wisdom Institute exists as an expression of gratitude to those who helped make UMBC the stellar universe it is today. Even the bells are ringing that we didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, we too are grateful, for we are gifted to know you as a leader, colleague, mentor, and most fortunately, as a friend. I am honored to call Dr. Philip Rouse to the podium to say a few words and share some of his reflections and thoughts about our wonderful UMBC. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Dr. Brass. I was so kind. Goodness, goodness. Please sit down, please. Please be seated. Um, how incredibly kind. Um, I'll move the microphone. How incredibly kind, Diane. Thank you so much. I should mention that phone ringing, by the way, was my wife calling in to correct you, Diane. <laughs> um, and, I, and I also just learned that Sandy's just been handed a card uh, for me to explain what nanostructures and reliability is. And other things as well. Yeah, probably. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the next three hours to be able to do that. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to thank Diane, Diana, the Wisdom Institute board for all their hard work, everything it took to create not only the Wisdom Institute, but this wonderful event today. So thank you, everybody. I'd also like to thank, um, who are out there right now, our dining staff who put on this amazing spread for us today. I'm looking forward to enjoying my dessert in a few moments. Uh, um, so I was asked by Diane to share a few, um, I think you called them reflections, Diane. And of course, it's tempting when you're asked to give reflections, especially when you're on the threshold of stepping down from a position, um, to turn such reflections into a sort of listing of what you think your personal legacy is. And you know, as well as I, that I'm certainly not going to do that. And that's because ev that everything we have achieved as a university and as a community since our founding of UMBC is the result of hard work and commitment of our entire community. And I've been so fortunate to, to be provost and to play perhaps some small part in the development of UMBC and our community, both past and present and hopefully in the future as well. So I was thinking about Dan's request about reflections, and a sort of image came into my mind uh, from that word reflection. It took me back to my optics lab 
when I was an undergraduate at Bristol. You know, we had, when we had to do experiments with lenses and lasers and, and goodness knows what. I'm a theoretical physics, physicist, by the way, so you can... Um, you'll have to believe what I say here. <laughs> um, and it's an optical vi device that we used to use. And some of you will know what this is called. I can't remember what it's called. Maybe Valerie would know. Um, but it's like a mirror, but it's only a partial mirror. So it reflects light back, but also a significant of the fra fraction of the light passes through. And that means that, at least to me, and I hope to you, that any reflection that we might have on the past also contains a tangible projection into the future. So when I joined UMBC as an assistant professor back in 1990, the reason I chose to come to UMBC, and I did have some other offers, but I chose to come here Actually, not because it had the best research infrastructure or the facilities or, frankly, the best salary. I came here for two things, two reasons. And I know that almost every single one of you will feel the same way. The first was that both teaching and research were highly valued. And there was at UMBC, and I learned this just from my first visit, an implicit understanding that great research and great teaching are entangled with one another in a way that makes it more than the sum of the parts. The second reason was that I felt I would have the opportunity to play some part in the building of a great and new university. This had actually little to do with UMBC being young, although it was fairly young back in those days. But it had to do with the people and the community, which was seemingly so open to innovation and ideas, even from a junior faculty member. So here's really the reflection or the projection. So when I was appointed provost, and this is very personal, I sensed a change in our community. Nothing actually to do with me or being provost at the time. It just happened to occur to me at that time. And it's, it's pretty hard to describe, but I hope you might understand it and have experienced it yourself. Now, I suppose it's, it's sort of inevitable when you're building a university from the ground up that that involves some uncertainty. I always think of this as being a bit like asking which one of your parents you're going to grow up into. And in this case, would it be the two traditional ways we think about universities, certainly in the United States? The large research university as opposed to the small liberal arts college? What I sensed at that point of time is the confidence of this community, the confidence to make our own way in the higher education landscape, that we did not need to follow a traditional path. In other words, it's the genius of the and rather than the or. And that idea, in some sense, and Valerie has already referred to it, captured in the new vision statement that the community developed as part of the last strategic planning process. As I said, the vision statement was actually developed by the entire community. And many of you participated in that, and you know what it was like. It was great fun. Uh, it took quite a long time to do it, trying to capture you know, what, what, it, what, what were the things that when you look at that vision, and I still look at it today, actually, and I look at that and I say, that is exactly UMBC. That's exactly what I feel about UMBC. But I did to get, get to suggest something. Um, that sort of ended up in that statement. And that's the words that our UMBC community refines, redefines excellence in higher education. I didn't 
suggest quite that. And it was vigorously debated, by the way. I actually suggested describing or using the phrase a new model of the public university. Um, I think I got that because in my earlier days, I was very interested in the English Civil War. And uh, those of you who are familiar with that will know about the new model army uh, that was developed as part. I think that's where I got the, got the idea, you know, a major change and in, in, in innovation. But uh, I actually think it reads much better than uh, that suggestion. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and give you an example, which you're all familiar with. Um, but I'm going to point to just three of the many achievements that have occurred over the last decade. There are many other achievements, not only in the last decade, but through the entire life of this university. And I can't say them more, but I've picked these ones in particular um, because I think they're an example of what I was trying to think about in terms of a new model of a university, or as is expressed in our vision statement, a community that redefines excellence in higher education. So the first, I'm going to do three things. Um, the first is our classification as a Carnegie Community Engaged Campus. The second is our classification, very recently, as an R1 research university. And the third is our consistent placement in the top 10 U US universities for teaching excellence and, by the way, innovation as well. Now, each of those achievements, I'm sure you agree, are important in their own right as recognition of excellence in what we do. But what is perhaps most remarkable is that we are recognized and do all three simultaneously. And I'm not sure there's any other university in the country that can make that claim. It reflects who we are today and everything we have built together over many decades. And it transmits or projects to the future our collective aspirations for the UMBC community. So thanks so much for your attention and everything you do and have done for this remarkable community. And thank you for the honor and privilege of being able to serve as provost and more importantly, being a member of this wonderful UMBC community. Thank you so much. I'm not going to have to explain quantum entanglement now, am I? <laughs> yes. With the same energy that we saw earlier today. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Thank you. UMBC is a new model, and I think a superb model for how to not only foster education, but to continue life in a way that has meaning and value, joy, and love. This really is a wonderful, wonderful place, and that's why we're all still here today. So we thank you. And Philip, we wanted to, as an expression of our gratitude for all you have done for UMBC over the years, and certainly for the Wisdom Institute, we want to give you a small memento, if we might. Kathy Sutphin, Associate Director of the Wisdom Institute, has been collecting messages of good wishes and appreciation from fellow retirees. These heartfelt messages are included in the gift bag with a UMBC frame. There are an awful lot in there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna take me a while. You. And you are to read each and every one. <laughs> and I can tell you, I'm sure that there will be those days you will go back and open that bag yet again and say, yes. Life is worth living. So I think you will cherish those messages. But we're also going to um, have a photograph taken of you with Dr. Valerie. <laughs> oh, that's very Southern, by the way. I am Miss Diane. Uh, more often Grams, but Miss Diane. <laughs> but we will have a photograph taken, and we will send it to you to have you inserted into the, to the frame, and it will be of you. And, and Valerie together 
so you can remember this day. And we will also gift you with a framed um, photograph as well. And we really do hope it'll bring good memories to both of you as this day. So now you may sit, Philip. I seldom get to tell him what to do. <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm going to do so. Thank you so much. There really was one more message to Philip, but I wasn't going to make him stay up here and listen. Um, I once worked for the Gerontology Research Center, and we tried to talk about how biofeedback might stop blushing. Well, Philip and I are both people who blush, and biofeedback at that time had not come up with the cure. <laughs> so I let him step down and sit down. But Philip, as you step down for your, from your position as provost, and as you prepare for retirement, I hope you reflect on your time at UMBC with joy, with pride, and with confidence that your next chapter will be as exciting and meaningful as those already written. Once you do retire, you, like most of us here, will automatically become a member of the Wisdom Institute. <laughs> and I hope you know you will be most welcome. After all, it is true, without you, the Wisdom Institute would not exist. Philip, on behalf of everyone here, let me say again, for all of your support and all that you have done, thank you. <laughs> President Valerie, we are also very, very grateful to you. Thank you for making UMBC your new academic home. We are so glad you have chosen us. Thank you, too, for sharing your reflections and your vision and your truth, if you will, with us today. It's most, really, most reassuring to know that you cherish the same values and hopes for UMBC that we hold in our hearts. We truly find solace in knowing that our work laid a strong foundation for UMBC's continued success under your leadership, and we see that on the horizon for sure. We are most pleased to welcome you to UMBC, and we really do look forward to working with you in the future. So thank you. Your bold conversations have transformed what, what it means to think about the future here at UMBC. Listening with heart and with mind, we know that we are going to move forward in ways that are going to take UMBC even further ahead. And Philip, it will be yet again another new model for higher education and for UMBC. So we thank you both. On behalf of the Wisdom Institute Board, let me express gratitude to each and every one of you who are assembled here today. You are the Wisdom Institute. You are the reason we exist. Friends, colleagues, hugs, tears, shouts of joy, that's who we are. We, w we welcome your ideas about what activities we might include in our menu of events for the future. We ask you to join us at these events as they are offered. Feel free to bring a friend. We come to you with open arms, and you come to us as well. You may consider joining an existing committee, and as I noted earlier, you don't even have to be a member of the board to do so. Minimal meetings, lots of fun. So think about it. Think about it. Lastly, we want to thank everyone who brought some, something for Retriever Essentials. Your generous contributions really make a difference. And yes, we have students in need. So thank you. And we wanted to announce that all the teddy bears and all the dogs and all the toys on the tables will also be contributed to Retriever Essentials. They go to our students. And we thought they were preferable over flowers. So I hope you agree. So again, thank you for coming. I have just a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you're going on the tour of the Interdisciplinary Life Sciences Building, you can meet in the lobby downstairs. But first, you are to stay, have dessert, have coffee, tea, whatever. Um, but then we will gather downstairs. And at that time, um, Kathy Sutphin will take you over to the building. And Dennis Cuddy will be our guide and our host for the tour. But now, we really want you to. Sit back, relax. There'll be no more talk at the microphone. We want you to enjoy dessert and conversation with one another. Whoops, Patricia? 
we actually can meet almost at any time, and maybe the only other announcement we'll have is when Kathy says, assemble downstairs and we'll break up to meet downstairs. I don't think we have to look at the clock precisely. We'll gauge it by um, the tone and tenor of the room. And we also want to ask, please, um, we want to be environmentally conscious as we can. Please leave your name tags on the table, and these will be recycled and reused. So again, <laughs> Diana said, these polymers, yes, leave them on the table. <laughs> So thank you again, and enjoy dessert and this beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you. <laughs>